Fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to episode 166 of the Falcoholic Live. I am your host, Kevin Knight, at Falcoholic Kevin on Twitter, joined by a very, very special guest this evening. He is Will McFadden of the Falcoholic and of the Believe Falcons podcast. Uh, Will, how are we doing tonight? Oh, man, Kevin, to uh, quote maybe the most famous person on the planet right now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking Pats by 22 uh, tomorrow <laughs> night. <laughs> yep, yep. I mean, uh, it's certainly not a rosy outlook for the Falcons heading into Thursday night football. Uh, and it's not just because the Falcons are injured. I'm not sure they'd be, you know, close to favored or or even, you know, within a, a field goal in terms of the spread, even if they were healthy. Yeah. But uh, we're going to get to that, guys. We're going to talk about Thursday night football a little bit later in the show. But before we get to that... Uh, we're going to recap the Falcons' 4-5 and five start to the season, uh, which, you know, I think for, for most, it's probably right about where folks thought they'd be. But how they looked getting to this record is probably a bigger question because I think you could argue that this team maybe shouldn't be 4-5, and five, maybe should be some other record, and we'll get to that. Uh, and then, of course, we'll touch on the Cowboys' loss uh, here first before we get into that. But I don't think we need to linger, you know, super-duper long on all that. Um no. But, uh, yeah, I mean, speaking of the Cowboys loss, Will, uh, any any takeaways from that that, you know, are really important that you want to get off other than the fact that it was terrible in every way? <laughs> yeah, frankly, I've tried my best to totally forget this game um, as ever existed. But, I mean, I, I think that what Arthur Smith really said after the game, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about in the lead up to this Pats game, because if there is kind of any one coach or organization who is does this maybe better than any team over the last you know, decade plus um, it is the Patriots but that is not only coming in with the right game script uh, but being able to enforce that early and really it's it's kind of like um, you know in in Rocky 4 when Rocky punches Drago and, and he gets cut and people are like, he bleeds, he is a man, and like you can beat him, and what that like that's the way that football games kind of go. And it's that that first team to really trip or, or get totally far away from what they wanted the game to be coming in to a Sunday. The team that's able to kind of get that first punch and, and knock the other team on its back leg a little bit usually will win in this league. And that's usually the difference between kind of the good and the bad teams. What I saw from Atlanta which was most disappointing. They just never put together anything close to an answer. And the Cowboys jumped on them from the get-go. I actually think the Falcons had a pretty decent first quarter. And then that second quarter happened. And Arthur Smith said they kind of came out in the, the third quarter, obviously trying to get some momentum because at that point, everything's really kind of like hanging on the edge. You're, you've only got like a possession or two because they were down by so much. And... The, the first series, I think they had the drop on like third down and then Mac got picked and it was kind of like, all right, well, that's the game. And at that point, it doesn't matter if it's 21 to 20 or 500 to zero. Uh, I, I think Arthur Smith rightfully kind of packed it up and said, look, not our week. Uh, we'll get a short week. We'll try again on Thursday, but we got to just kind of flush this one and get back to work. I think that's kind of just my biggest takeaway is teams, teams have games like this. It's now how do they respond? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I mean, we were talking about it right before we came on air that like, you know, Will's watching, you know, the Cleveland Patriot versus the Patriots game, you know, doing that, you know, ahead scouting there because uh, Will's, a, Will's a true professional. But, um, you know, it, the Browns <laughs> lost 45 to seven the same week. And there were this was a, a weekend of many, many blowouts across the league. So it's not like yeah. this is. And you like know, the Falcons, the Browns, the Browns went down the field on their opening drive and mm -hmm. scored a touch. I mean, it was seven to nothing for most of the first quarter there um, yep. in that game. So like it, a similar thing where it's really the first team that, that domino to kind of fall in the, in the wrong direction. Um, and then as a team strong enough mentally and, and talent wise to bounce back, if things go wrong, that's the sign of a good team as well. But yeah, Browns and Falcons looked like they would make it a game early and then got steamrolled. Yeah. That's, I think what was most disconcerting is that, you know, we, I think, reasonable people knew that like the defense wasn't likely to get a lot of stops in this game. I mean, they did get the one early in the game and I was like, okay, you know, that's, that's nice. Uh, yeah. but you know, it, 
it got off the rails so quickly and we knew that it was going to be the Falcons needing to basically go tit for tat with the Cowboys in order to sort of have a chance at this one. And, you know, they fell behind very quickly and they, they never sniffed it after that. I mean, it was those first two drives both looked pretty good. Um, but then the execution fell apart. Uh, we had drops, we had Matt Ryan getting pressured. Um, and it just went downhill so fast. You know, 36 to 3 at halftime. With, yeah. What's up with the drops on this team, dude? I, I know we've kind of been talking around that topic a, a little bit in, in the group kind of chat. But, like, what? They, they are dropping more balls this year than I can remember in, in quite a while. Yeah, it's it's a big concern. Um not that it's necessary. Like drops tend to be kind of random unless you're like a drop prone player that just has trouble catching the football. But um, it seems like when right. it rains, it pours with the Falcons and drops. Like it's like either they don't have a problem with it or it's like they all drop the ball in the same game, like at the same time. You know, that happened in the Eagles On, like, game. every third um, down. Yes, yeah. like uh, against the Panthers is the same thing. So like, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a mental thing where they sort of get into a funk and, and can't find a way out. It's It's been really rough to watch and I will definitely touch on that receiving talent or lack thereof in this sort of, as we sort of transition <laughs> towards the the season review aspect here but I also want to welcome in another guest uh we have joining us now from ESPN Eric Robinson he is at underscore Eric underscore Robinson I think unless you've put ESPN in your handle by now Eric no I, I did not I <laughs> okay Okay. Well, not Eric A. Robinson. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Definitely not. Definitely not. Well, how are you doing tonight, man? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Just getting into yeah, this well. Dallas game as little as possible. But now that you're here, you can Oof. share in the suffering. Uh, you know what? What were some of your takeaways from that? Uh, if you call it a game, I call it more like torture for Falcons fans. But you know, whatever. The talent disparity, I think it was quite obvious. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that we definitely pointed out already coming into the season. Um, and, and certain games, we, we kind of, you know, pointed it out a little bit. But I think Sunday was an obvious sign as far as how far the Falcons need to go to at least be competitive in this league against some of the top tier teams. Um, yeah. I think that was that was the clear and obvious sign there for me, honestly. Um, not going to point any fingers at one particular person. Not going to call out Arthur Smith or Matt Ryan or Dean Pease or anybody. Like that. No, these Sunday was an obvious sign that the Falcons need an upgrade in talent across the board on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people were getting on Ryan because his stats obviously look really bad. Um, but there were Dallas had ten passes defensed. I believe Ryan had twenty one yeah. attempts, um, yeah. twenty three attempts, something like that. So over half of his attempts were defensed by Dallas defense. <laughs> so it's not like he wasn't putting the ball in the right spot. Like receivers couldn't get separation. I think there were three drops, credited yep. drops as well. So. Um, Didn't have his guy out there. Cordero was hurt early on and and was absent for the rest of the game. You know, it's just what what can Matt do? Pull a yeah. rabbit out the hat? I, mean, I don't. <laughs> what do you, what do you Sometimes you know, based on my mentions, I think that's what people expect at this point. But um. <laughs> he makes five million a year. But yeah, whatever. Sure. I, yes. I, even a thirty-five million dollar quarterback cannot win games on his own. He needs the right parts around him, and that's. Ryan doesn't have that right now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's rough. Uh, it's rough out there for Matt Ryan and this offense. Um, you know, I guess we should probably briefly touch on the defense. It, it wasn't a surprising outcome to see them sort of get, you know, pantsed in the way that they did. But, um, you know, it was the, the level to which... I think it was. Okay. I'm ready well, to say it was, it. It was a surprising yeah, outcome. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm willing to give the Atlanta's defense the the respect that they have at least earned with the small amounts of growth that they've shown, particularly in the past defense. And I know, I know some of those numbers, especially kind of just the overall broader stats that they kind of get talked out about the most uh, can be some misleading, especially when it comes to pass plays um, and, and overall defense and, and rankings and things. So I know that it like there's, they're not great yet. 
by by and I'm talking specifically about the past defense because that's really the only one part of this this team that uh defensively has been working. I mean, they're still just terrible at getting pressure against the quarterback. Um, and their run defense has really fallen off. And I I am really curious to maybe dive into that a little bit deeper during the second half of the season if that continues to be a trend because Dallas's defense with Dan Quinn, they're great against the run, bad against the pass. So like to me, that's a coordinator thing. That's kind of a scheme thing in the way that you prioritize. But by far the biggest need kind of coming in over the last three, four years outside of pass rush, show up 1B need secondary. And it's working right now. I mean, I know they got torched by the Cowboys, but this was the, the AJ Terrell is absolutely just a stud this season. And I really think that they, they, we have not seen many plays at all where they just looked completely lost on the back end. They're playing tight coverage. They're, they're pressuring these guys. And I think we're starting to see Dean Pease ramp up some of the pressure. So I wasn't, you know, I'm still not expecting the Falcons to go out and, and dominate any one game defensively, but I do now think that their ceiling is uh, weirdly a little bit higher, um, even though kind of no other true star has emerged. Um, it's not, still not a great year for Dion's kind of not a great year for Foyer. Um, <laughs> so it really is just kind of AJ and then Grady's doing what Grady does, but like he just gets so much attention and you can only do so much from where he is on the field on any given play, but it, they're, they're slowly making steps in the right direction, uh, yeah. I think, on defense. So so I was coming into this game not really interested to see them against the league's best offense because it was going to be kind of a measuring, but I never really thought it was going to be that bad. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'm the one that needs to reassess and, and reevaluate the way that I'm viewing this defense. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say that I was, I was shocked. I, 30 points, fine. I didn't expect them to put 40. Yeah. I... <laughs> I'm not going to say I was surprised, um, but to see to see the the box score and the stat line and the team had literally had no sacks, no tackles for loss. Yeah. You know, like I don't think they even had. I don't even think they registered a quarterback hit. Like that's very that's very discouraging. But at the same time, it's something that we've been seeing for a while now. To be quite honest with you, you know, like the it, and. I guess it's because of the fact that they had the upgrade in, in defensive play call with Dean Pease and to still see these kind of results. And to me, it's more of a how much more evidence do you need to know that they need to upgrade this particular Yeah, it's the players. Game. Yes. It's the players. Because it's yeah. we've changed schemes, we've changed play callers, and it's still the same issue. Um, and and that was that again, that was very discouraging to see that. And that's honestly with the way the team has been constructed over the uh, last uh, several years, you know, they've, they've had a, you know, an offense has been able to put up points. They've, you know, they've had a, a defense that may have been able to get some turnovers here and there. But the one thing that I've been craving for so long was just a respectable pass rush. Like that is all it, I'm not saying they got to have a mouse Garrett, but <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> something, mm -hmm. something. Well, I, I think the biggest red flag for me for the defense, right? And with the pass rush as well, when Dean P said that he really had only put in like 30% of his playbook at that point, like yeah. coaches don't, don't really say that to me, that was a little right. bit of, of a message. Um, and who knows? I don't know Dean P's. Uh, I, we never cross paths um, right. there. So he may just be like, no, I'll just tell it straight. Like I'll, I'm surly. Like I've been in this league longer <laughs> than you've been alive. So like, I'm just going to say we, story. <laughs> yeah, we only have 30% of our playbook in here. These guys didn't pick it up as quick as, as some other teams in the past. That's a massive red flag, though. I mean, that that speaks to exactly what you're saying, which is it's it's more of a systemic like roster problem than it is, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. a a coaching or organizational thing. And and we'll see what they can do with with maybe a real offseason. And we'll see how much now that they know how kind of deep the the stuff goes. Um I, I'm very curious to see how that uh, impacts their approach to this offseason compared to a relatively conservative approach. We understand why last offseason. What, what do they what do they prioritize a lot more this offseason? Is it is it getting that pass rush, those those edge rushers that can get after the quarterback and win one on ones? Or is it a situation where they may prioritize upgrading the secondary? Because he's also said, you know, in, in pressers that. You know, they're having trouble on the back end. 
Um, and in certain certain situations, at certain times, they're having trouble on the back end holding that coverage that may allow the you know below average pass for us to finally get home a little bit. So, what is it? Is it, it is going to be interesting a little bit to see what they prioritize this offseason because yeah, again, the lack of pass rush really has been a thorn in the side of the franchise for quite a long time right now. Yeah, um, it's it's so. getting quite ridiculous to how poor the pass rush is on a weekly basis, and um, it's it's quite bad. Uh, before we get on to even more badness, uh, Evan, welcome to the show Ev- at Evan Birchfield on the Twitters. Evan, how we doing? I'm doing good, fellas. How are you? Good, good. You wearing the Seinfeld hat what? for George? I haven't seen him, so he might miss mm. it. Well, <laughs> well, just in case he. I'm should. sure he'll watch the replay, but yeah. <laughs> shout out shout out to that that's funny yeah. um yeah you got any any takes on this dallas game before we sort of uh, gloss oh, no. over it completely yeah <laughs> no i i have nothing more to add it is uh it's a burn the tape sort of game you know yeah like I, i'm not gonna like throw away the whole rest of the season because there's you know well, another half of the season but that just kind of was a wake-up call that they don't belong in the conversation of like, I mean, I know they were the seven seed technically, but with the expanded playoffs like this, I mean, if they have to do like a matchup like that, it would be just getting embarrassed on national TV. Like they're not in the same league as the Cowboys. The Cowboys were always great on paper. It's just, you know, and they were a few plays away from kind of being undefeated too. uh, When you look at their schedule and, you know, week one, uh, if I remember correctly, they lost, um, it was kind of like a fluky, like no call defense pass interference or something. Four missed field goals as well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, So, I mean, it wasn't like they were like a shitty team or something like the Cowboys team is really good. I I know how, how uh, their offense is, you know, seeing their defense without like Demarcus Lawrence and Randy Gregory, um, who's on IR. I mean, (laughs) I can only imagine that team at full force. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it was just more of, I think, like a, you know, lessen your expectations with this team. Um, It's, you know, a good year to find out who we have, uh, like Jalen Hawkins, like younger players going forward. But, yeah, that was that was us versus like a legit Super Bowl team. And we kind of saw the outcome. I, I will say this. I am glad to see a team that is much more talented than the Falcons get obliterated on the road as well. So mm-hmm. seeing, yeah. seeing the Browns getting roasted made yeah. me feel, I, and I'm not really a moral victory guy. I, I, I'm, I, that's, that's not <laughs> my thing. But looking at that, it's like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, there's a team that is clearly more talented than the Falcons, but they just, they might as well have stayed I, on the bus. I haven't games. watched much of the Browns, but I think like, you know, the, obviously they didn't have Nick Chubb who was on COVID and then, cream hunts on ir plus baker's got some shoulder thing that's apparently like yeah. gonna linger on their whole season so i don't know how much of that game um i didn't watch any of that game so i don't know if you know they just looked terrible or if it had to do oh, with missing just, like their rushing they attack they yeah not awful they but oh, they, who, they looked... who beat them like <laughs> the team that the falcons played tonight, right, bro. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good timing. Make, yeah. Doesn't make you feel any better. Good segue. Yeah. We laid it out. I, I will. Sec, yeah. I will say though that. Uh, sorry, man. I don't want to step all over your segue, but uh, <laughs> um, the the Browns the Browns were coming off of of their own blowout win right. two weeks ago when they mm-hmm. beat the Bengals, who a lot of people expected. It was a very similar kind of like Pats Browns that like two AFC competitors. Browns absolutely crush them 41 16 mm-hmm. then go right right so i wonder how much of this actually has to do and is reflective of the the talent between the two teams you know i think the browns there's a chance that they're probably closer to the pats than we think that the pats are not all of a sudden the 2007 patriots again just because they blew it out i think that there was some we they got rid of obj in cleveland they kicked the absolute crap out of the Bengals. People may have been feeling themselves reading some press clippings leading up into the, into the game, and you know Bill Belichick doesn't let anybody in New England have fun. So I, I think that was a sign because in games they didn't have OBJ, they still played fairly well. Yeah. Um, but I think Sunday was a clear sign of the difference in coaching staffs. I think that if you're comparing depth charts and talent, I, you know mm-hmm. those, those two rosters. You can you can put side by side and and and, yeah. and check a few boxes on both sides. But I think 
certainly like the week to week part of yeah. coaching. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. not nece- not necessarily like I think Kevin Stefanski is awesome on Sundays. It's an awesome. I think, coach. He's, a, I think he's a great coach. Yes. But it's there, that's there's two parts of coaching. There's the right. game day coaching, mm-hmm. and there's the week long CEOs. All right, are we are we letting this player get some rest today in practice? Yep. What's on the menu for the for the meal plans all throughout the week? Yep. Hey, what are we tra- like? What's our travel situation? Are we going on Saturday on Friday? Yep. All of that stuff is is what really separates the great coaches, um, the good coaches, and the guys that just can't handle the job mm-hmm. because it's just too much responsibility and it's yep. it's too much to ask for one person. So, I think for sure, absolutely, yep. Kevin Stefanski yep. in his third year going up against Bill Freakin Belichick, yeah, probably got out coached yeah. <laughs> Monday yeah, through definitely. Friday. And, you, and again, you got a you got a coaching staff that the last few weeks they've been, all they've really been dealing with is whether or not one receiver is going to play yeah. a game where he's going to be on the roster. And, and again, that takes a lot away from, like you said, just the, the strategy throughout the week, because you're mm-hmm. answering more questions of, Hey, how are we going to approach this game plan to is OJ is OBJ at practice today? Is he going to practice today? All this type of stuff. So, yeah, so <laughs> that's it, what it, they it, saw. They saw yeah. a clear, you saw a clear difference and not to mention, and, and to, to kind of sort of segue to tomorrow, get to tomorrow's game. I'll be quite honest with you. I think the Falcons are getting the Patriots at the absolute worst time right now. Yeah, the Patriots yeah. have won four in a row in five of their last six. They've caught a groove. They've caught a rhythm. The coaching staff, the defense, the defense has already been playing well. Now Mac Jones is getting more comfortable out of the week. This is not a great opponent for the Falcons. Right and now. they're getting Damian Harris back from concussion. He wasn't even they in the last yeah. game. They didn't even. They don't even need Harris. They get Ramondre Stevenson was mm-hmm. awesome they last don't. week. So it's like, yes, yeah, so it's just, yeah, it's going to be a rough matchup, and we're definitely going to cover that as well. Um, before we get to more of the midseason review stuff, want to read off some tips first of all from Ray Moon with the ten dollars. Thank you so much, Ray. He says, all right, who the hell is Matt going to throw to on Sunday? Because I'm pretty sure Kyle Pitts will be triple teamed. Um, that's a great question. Uh, Mar- Marvin Hall. Yeah, maybe. yeah, maybe Marvin Hall gets a target. Uh, <laughs> if, if Will wants to get out there and and run some drag routes, by all means. Yep. Yeah, me. I mean, I'll, I would, you know, can't be that much worse than whatever yeah. our current wide receiver four or five situation is. But um, <laughs> just tuck and roll, Will. Just tuck and roll. Okay, don't, yep. don't try to be a hero. Sideline, <laughs> sideline catches it. only. I'm gonna catch that and go I'm right out of bounds. I'm gonna yeah. Cole Beasley the hell out of this. Yeah, I'm yeah. catching it and. Get I'm right, right out of bounds. I'm like, okay, you can throw me out routes. That's it. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Corners and outs. That's Matt, all I got. Matt, yeah. Just only here. Yeah. yeah. Throw it where only I can catch it, which is out of bounds. So. <laughs> throw it to, on the ground every time. If I'm not catching yeah. the ball, diving to the ground, then mm-hmm. you've done something wrong. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, Ray, it's obviously a really bad situation with the receiving core. We're going to talk about that more, I think, in the, the review part. Uh, you know, touching on that, look, we said going into the season, like the receiving core with Calvin Ridley is not that bad, but who's behind Calvin Ridley? And now we're seeing the result of that, which is that there's no one behind Calvin Ridley. So uh, that's that's just something we're going to have to deal with. Um, we got Solaire with the $1. He said, just like last year at Dallas, I'm now officially in draft takes mode. Please, for the love of God, can we get an edge rusher in the first round who's not a bust? Tell me, it's something defense. about going to Dallas and getting yeah. embarrassed that makes you <laughs> say, all right, you know what, bring on the draft. Right. Yeah, something about that that matchup. I don't know. But, yeah, Solaire just wants the defense to be semi-entertaining, and I'm totally there. Um, I do, you know, it, it is something worth discussing because where the Falcons are at right now, you know, picking, I think it's 12th. Um, 11. You know, I do wonder – 11, okay, yeah. Um, I do wonder if, if they go with a corner there. And the reason is because this is like the deepest edge rushing class I have ever seen in my life. Like there's going to be like 20 edge rushers in the top 100. Um, take all I, of them. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not saying don't take multiple edge rushers. I'm just saying like, the, take, all, yeah. take all 20. Yeah. I mean, I'm down. I'm totally down. If we get 20 picks in the top hundred, yeah, I think you should take at least five edge rushers, but um, you know, it's a uh, I corner thins out a lot quicker. So if they are trying to upgrade corner, um, and then try to go for, you know, another defensive pick in the second round, like, like edge, you know, I think that could be, um, a good option there, but I would not be at all opposed to edge in the first round. Don't get me wrong. I, I think at that spot, best defensive player available. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair too. Um, I, at, but I was gonna, I was about to say, Eric, I, I like that you brought up the def- best defense player available. Um, because th- that's when this will get tested, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, 
I th- I do respect Thomas Mitchell. I think he was he was good. I mean, he helped the Falcons get to a Super Bowl and and have their best like stretch under his uh, reign mm-hmm. in franchise history. So like we know his his strengths and his weaknesses and all of that. Right. He found himself in a hole eventually that that then they were like kind of trying to dig out of with the draft. Mm-hmm. And that's when they were they were you can sit there and say sure we're sitting here at 11 and and Jamar Chase is still on the board. Mm-hmm. But like you're almost forced to kind of pass that up because you just have such glaring spots. Mm-hmm. So now Terry Fontenot, yeah, he came in and said, "All right, we're going to draft the best player available." Frankly, I you know, I don't know how much or how well he knew the the roster he had in place. Like I I and that's no slight at his his preparation or knowledge or familiarity or anything. Like once you kind of get really really under the hood uh and obviously then play with your guys for a whole season, like you see what's really a dire dire need and what is is a luxury spot or what's so I'm that, that's another thing where do they if like if they take a, a, an offensive tackle because he slipped seven spots and they think he's the best player on the board long term that might work out but like people are going to lose their minds <laughs> yeah well, i mean and that was a similar strategy that the saints exercised during his time there yeah. in New Orleans, where they you know, especially early on in the draft, you know, they didn't really they made some head scratching moves. Yeah, they, they did. They made some head scratching moves, but they made moves that, you know, it panned out over time, like getting a guy like Teron mm-hmm. Armstead, getting a guy like Ryan Ramchak and and, uh, you know, drafting Eric McCoy uh, a couple of years ago, even yeah. though it wasn't a big glaring need on the interior. But they just, you know, they they st- stood true to their their BPA. And, right. and the, the Fontenot probably carried that same strategy in this year's draft. I mean, I'm pretty sure when everything laid itself out and it looked from afar like, okay, we knew about what was going on with with Julio, so it may have Mm -hmm. prompted him to want to take Kyle Pitts. To be quite honest with you, that might have been the strategy the entire time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, hey, we're going to take the best player there. And just it just so happened to be a tight end sitting there at four. So, yeah, I, I agree with you, Will. Like, I, I think that might honestly be a strategy that they use and lean on early, especially next year. I mean, they're probably going, they're going to have to because there's so many holes. There's so many glaring needs to fill yeah. Yeah. Um, on this roster. So why not just take the best player, best defensive player available, even if that means taking a nose tackle out of Georgia. <laughs> Jordan Davis. I know the chat's like all fired I'm, up about I'm Jordan Davis. So, I'm all yeah. for it. I'm all for taking a 335 pound nose tackle because the guy can move like a goddamn defensive end. Okay. That sounds yeah. like Dean Pease's dream. <laughs> he, I mean, he had, he had went Will for it for a little bit. So he knows. He's got a type. He, he knows what it's like. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and I, I would not also rule out, like, if they are picking at this part in the draft, um, you know, a trade down is an option. I would not be oh, surprised absolutely. at all by that. They need the resources. If they can get more day two picks, they're going right. to. And um, I think they're going to try to load up because that's that's really one of the best ways they have to improve this roster is those day two picks um, because yeah. and, and they were, they're not they going to have not, a ton of cap space. So They were not successful at that last year. So I'm pretty sure they're going to try to take a swing at it again or last this year's yeah. draft. I'm the higher sure up they are, the more likely they are to trade down. That's for sure. So, um, but see, like I, I, I understand the the philosophy of stockpiling picks, greater chance to hit on a guy like Ade Ogundeji, for for example. But right. um, th- at some point, it's like this team, you got to add some elite talent. Sure, yeah. it was mm-hmm. awesome that right. they were able to do that with Kyle Pitts. But like, if you're missing out on the AJ Terrells of the world to go get a, um, you know, who was a, who was another corner from that? Who's the dude from like Northwestern? Um, who I freaking loved, but uh, yeah. like, well, like, was he Gladney not, in that class too? Like, Jeff Gladney, Gladney Jeff Gladney, yeah. that's yeah. KSU, right? Yeah. yeah, um, or TCU, TCU, TCU. some, some um, CU, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, I loved Jeff Gladney coming out, and I would have sat there and Me said, too. Yeah, trade back, go get Jeff Gladney, he's gonna be great. AJ Terrell's a freaking amazing, and I'm so happy yeah. we have him on, a, on our team. And so, that's where, uh, at some point, like, you're saying that there's such kind of a talent discrepancy go land the best players. And and I know that, that the odds say that you've got the better chance kind of, again, long-term just stockpile as many, get as many young guys on here because they're going to need the cheap rookie contracts. But I also need some impactful, cheap, young talent. Right. Uh, just having cheap rookie contracts who are at the Mendoza line in, in terms of their ability to play on Sundays, that's not really getting the ball, like getting it done right now. And I think, yeah. I think it's also worth noting like, hey, 
we're sitting here and saying that, you know, maybe they should trade back or maybe they shouldn't. It's not as easy as we, right. as, as us right. just sitting yeah. here talking about on the podcast. Like you, the yeah. GMs are not just going to pick up a phone and say, Hey, you want to trade? Sure. Why not? Like it's, <laughs> it, it, there's a lot of layers that go into a trade, especially a trade down in the draft, especially like this past year trading down from five or f- from four. I'm sorry. Like that was not going to be easy. Yeah. So yeah. same thing here. Um, mm-hmm. I just think it would be it would be beneficial for him because of what we may be anticipating this offseason with a lot of guys on this roster being, you know, no longer Falcons and, yeah. and the, you know, the roster being trimmed down considerably. So they may have to lean on a larger rookie class than they wanted to. Um, yeah. But again, if your it's guy the is there, mm-hmm. if your guy is there at 11 and you want him, <laughs> go take get him. him. Go get, get him. him. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing with picking at 11 is like you sort of just let it come to you. And it's like if we like what we see, we take it. And if we don't, we try to trade down because yeah. somebody probably wants one of these guys. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to balk at Jordan Davis. No, no. no not, I mean, I think 11 like a little early. Like I'd rather be taking him, you know, where we were picking where did previously. Be a, where did which be is a, like, uh, be he went like fifth, 13, 15, somewhere yeah, in that range. Something like that. But I'm but I, I mean I remember the, the like the draft the draft is set and this can be the last thing I guess about the draft because there's still <laughs> what 10, 10 games left to play uh, yeah. we've got all off season or at least most of the rest of the season once things go south even more um, but I, I remember it was maybe the thing that Thomas got maddest at me for even though he he never really like told me it was it was in the subtle pass aggressive ways that he can yes. but I tweeted about Chris Lindstrom um, right after that pick. And basically was like, well, you know, is, is this a little high for it for a guard? Because I'm an idiot. And like, we all do the same thing where we just hear for months and we see all the mock drafts and Lindstrom's going 23rd. And it's like, wait, the Falcons took him at 16. Like yeah. that's, that's way too high based on uh, Todd McShay. Like, yeah. you know, it's, but, but those guys will tell you, they don't know anything. And then the, that it's just kind of, they're all, it's a, it's a right. vacuum chamber of, of information. But Thomas, essentially like looked at me and was like, dude, it doesn't matter what the public's like draft board looks like. It's, it's how these teams view this draft and what they're prioritizing. And these teams have more information than literally anybody else about that. And yeah, there's smoke screens, but like they know what their draft board says and they've got enough information Mm -hmm. to kind of know where a player is supposed to go. It's why you see these trades that happen where teams move back two spots. And it's like, that's weird. It's because they knew they were going to get their guy right there. And they picked up a seventh. Um, they pay so attention. he was like, Organization yeah, if, if, if Chris Lindstrom did not go to Atlanta, I'm very, North very Minnesota. confident that Minnesota yeah. was taking him with the yeah. next pick. So that's by definition not a reach because yeah. he was going off the board with and, the and, next and, pick. And, and that is, like you said, that is that those are things that teams know about, especially on draft day. I'm pretty right. sure Dimitrov had in the back of his mind, he was told like, hey, he was as good with that as anybody. He right. knew he like he Grady knew. Jarrett. The fact they got Grady Jarrett where they got him is like yeah. is why I will always say good things about Thomas Dimitrov because that's like a stroke of genius. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure he knew sitting in that draft room like, hey, if we don't take this guy, Minnesota is yeah, he got yeah. on his heels. Like again, teams, but and teams pay attention to these analysts, to these draft analysts. They just don't mold their draft boards or their draft strategy after. Mm-hmm. Out of you know, out of what they say, they, they do yeah. observe a few things here and there, but like you said, they put their own draft board together the way that they want to, and how they see, how they see. Yeah. Fit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and like, I think the, the takeaway for me is like, no one is going to remember that it was a reach if the player is really good. You know, Chris Lindstrom, really good. No one cares that he was drafted. <laughs> at was well. Yeah. No one cares. Uh, so just draft good players, I think is the message <laughs> we're trying to say. I remember here. when people were complaining when they, moved up for julio yeah it's like oh that's yeah. a reach you know yeah yeah wait yeah. that's who? the thing who yeah. did they move up for julio quintoris, quintoris. yes yes quintoris. I, I don't i don't remember that guy yeah <laughs> nope i don't recognize that name anymore um okay we got a two dollar i miss him too i miss him too <laughs> we got a two dollar from jason insert Gaines. wolverine said, meme yes exactly <laughs> just uh please come home yeah uh jason Gaines with the two dollars says one thing that made me happy this weekend was watching uh, Steve Sarkeesian blow a home game in overtime to Kansas. Hashtag horns down. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I don't actually have that much of a problem with Steve. 
like Sarkeesian? I don't know. I, I thought he I thought that he got a bad rap. Well, for the, the one thousandth time, Sarkees the offense was improving under Sarkeesian. Mm-hmm. He was in year yeah. three. Like, yeah, Matt Ryan's twenty eighteen was like <laughs> one of his best seasons. Yeah, so I mean, it was it was right on par with his MVP year. Like, let's. It was a unnecessary honest, scapegoat. Yeah. Whoever was the offensive coordinator after what Kyle Shanahan did was going to get hate. Yeah, like, that's it true. Didn't matter who it was. Yeah. I just, yeah, I just hate the rap that Sarkeesian got, and it didn't help because yeah, did he was coming coming into Atlanta, and he still kind of sort of had that cloud hanging over him as far as you know what he went through as as a USC and Washington head coach, and a lot of people use that against them. His per, you know, his personal uh, his personal skeletons and things like that, and use that against them. And but there was steady, there was gradual improvement every year mm-hmm. at offense with Sarkeesian yeah. here, but yeah. It was like a thing we were all aware of that the, whoever the offensive coordinator was, it was like year one was going to be a struggle, and then year two is where they improved. And that happened yeah. for Shanahan, and it happened for uh, Sark. So, yeah, uh, I've never had any it, ill will. It was a red zone them. narrative thing for yeah, Sark it was. at the end. It was yeah, a red yeah, zone it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, yeah. I remember that was all we were like. We were just sitting there talking in, in the building with like the digital team and just be like, all right, yeah, but like red zone stuff is kind of random, like year to year. And sure, like they, they they're getting down there. They were get like how many times did they get to like the seven yard line and and they ended up with a field goal, which is why we were all so frustrated and furious. But now it's like, God, get on the seven yard line. That sounds great. I'll take <laughs> take chances all day from down there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, that's a good time to segue into our more of our review stuff here. Uh, before we get to that, guys, I want to remind you, you can check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash falcoholiclive. Get access to some exclusive perks, including high-quality ad-free podcast audio of this show and exclusive access to a podcast version of this uh, of our post-game show as well. Uh, we just did our Q&A for November. We're going to have those coming every month. We also got other stuff cooking there uh, for the future, uh, so you can check that out. Please do like and subscribe if you haven't done that already. Hit that little bell icon to get notifications if you're so inclined. And, uh, yeah, make sure you follow all the great guests uh, we have on tonight. Really appreciate these guys coming on and giving their time. So, midway point, Falcons are 4-5. and five. I'll just say, like, this is about what I expected. Now, yeah. I thought the offense would look better, and I thought the defense would look worse. And I'm not using the game against Dallas as recency bias to say the defense, you know, looks like the worst thing I've ever seen. More like taking the whole product uh, into account. The offense hasn't been as good as I thought. The defense has been the defense uh, has been a little bit better. Um, so that's my kind of you know bird's eye view. But in terms of like, I predicted nine and eight. I think most of us here predicted between like seven and nine wins, except for Evan. Love you, Evan. I think you predicted like eleven wins. Um, no, you didn't have to call dude. me out like that. <laughs> we love Evan. Evan Evan's very. Right? Somebody had to be the uh, the optimist, and I think it was Evan. I, I, this yeah, year, I figured so. I'd take a shot. Yeah, um, why not? On paper, I thought maybe they could surprise, but I went eight in. Technically, that your prediction is still possible, Evan. So right. mm. you know, maybe I shouldn't. Okay. Let's revisit on, this yeah. in a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm seven and ten, just so we're all on the table here. Oh, okay, our, yeah. Our, mm-hmm. So I was nine and eight. We're all on the record. I think Eric was eight and nine. So we're all like in that general range. So mm-hmm. to me, this is pretty much in line with a finish in that range. Um, but yeah, I mean, so from a bird's eye view, this is kind of what I expected. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe we should have expected more offensive struggles. Obviously we couldn't predict what was going on with Ridley, but yeah, go ahead, exactly. Eric. Yeah. yeah. That was, mm-hmm. yeah, that's why. And was- we couldn't have predicted Patterson being. Right. That's a nice surprise. Yeah. Yeah. That mm-hmm. kind of cancels each other out a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> I, I felt he was going to be a prominent piece in the offense. I didn't expect him to be, you Like know, the number three, the, like, overall receiver in yards well, per route run or something? I did, ex- I did expect him to be a... PFF's, like, number two running back. I just, did, I just didn't see a team paying $3 million for a guy to just return kick. The most valuable right. contract in the NFL. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Give Terry Fondo credit for that. There's yes. No, he's, he's earned that credit. I don't No care. doubt. What the is, most valuable like, cre- contract. That's what he was brought in here for, for, for yes. getting those cheap bargains from those veterans, and that is what he's doing with Cordero Patterson. But yes, I, I, I agree with you there, Kevin. Like I did expect the offense to be a little bit better, but I'm going to just there, – there's going to be a but. There's going to be an asterisk, of course, because of what's going on really. And I, 
at the same time, I can't help but wonder because for a nice three or four game stretch there, that offense was was clicking with with Cordero, with Pitts. The run game still wasn't there, but Matt was still able to find a rhythm even without that element. And I just couldn't help but think like, man, what if 18 was out here on this field, man? How much better could it have looked in yeah. certain spots, especially this past week against Dallas? Now, could really be the difference in them going into Dallas and, and winning a game? No. But <laughs> I thought that Ridley on that field definitely could have made the game a little bit more competitive where he didn't have to go to Gage on fourth down or he didn't have to go to Pitts that's smothered on third down. He still had his outlet there, really. So, mm-hmm. I, I, like I say, I, I did expect the offense to be a little bit better, but no one expected, you know, what occurred with Calvin Ridley to occur. And, you know, by all means, you know, if he's in whatever time he still needs to to get over this hump, by all means, take it, man. If you need the rest of the year, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Mental health is very important. And that goes for Ridley and everybody else who's who's listening tonight and watching tonight. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, other than the Ridley thing, the offense has just not been as potent. It's more been inconsistent. I mean, I think they've had some great games and some pretty mediocre games. But yeah, I do want to get everybody else's kind of overall thoughts too. Uh, Will, you know, where are you sort of at with this four and five start? Is this sort of on expectation or is this better or worse than you were sort of predicting at this point? Um, it's, it's whelming. It's, it's neither over <laughs> nor, nor underwhelming, um, to me, because I, I think there's like a two, re, like really two ways to look at it, but also I'm going to throw a third in there because I'm needlessly, uh, difficult. Um, so the first one is, is the, is the macro sense, which, you know, Eric, you and Kevin alluded to the bird's eye view, all of that four and five on the surface. Yeah. I think all of us would have taken that before the season started. Uh, you know, I think if, if any of us had been told, hey, by by basically like the week before Thanksgiving, you guys are still going to be in the mix. You're not going to be eliminated, at least. I mean, by this point last year, the Falcons had fired both of their GM and their head coach. So like from that sense, things are, are pointing up uh, if, yeah. if we're using that as the baseline. <laughs> we, yeah. They are moving in the right direction. Right. But you flip that and you look at the, at the micro uh, view of the schedule and you go game by game. And that is where this starts to get a little bit fishy, um, or, or at least, you know, you, now that four and five record is, is kind of looking a little bit dicier because you've got a three point win against the Giants came on the road. Cool. Arthur Smith's first win. Uh, sure. Seven point win uh, against the Jets when it looked like they were about to blow that on the road in London. Still Ooh. a win. Awesome. Can't can't hate it. Two point win against the Dolphins when <laughs> they, you know, basically <laughs> We're the better team, I think, throughout like that entire game, and yet the Dolphins just hung around and, and came back. And yeah, so another yep. one, kind of by the skin of your teeth, against a bad team. Lose to the Panthers. That's fine. That was a that was like one of the weirdest, just dumbest, most boring games until this past Sunday. Uh, and then you beat the Saints, and that's like that is their best win by far of the season. Even though you know, yes, they allowed that fourth quarter comeback to happen. But you get my point. You got a blowout against a blowout loss against Dallas. You lost to the football team. You lost to the Bucks. You lost to the Eagles. So, like, it's not like that's the 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 Bills, the the Cowboys, the the Chargers, the Packers that you lost. Like, you lost to some bad teams as well. So, those are the kind of two things that I'm looking at. But the third thing that I brought up earlier is, if you dig a little bit further past just the broad like win loss totals, I actually am going to push back to you on you, Kevin, a little bit with the inconsistency on offense. Yes. From a scoring standpoint, it has been inconsistent. And I think the drops and I think the Calvin stuff definitely plays into it because two of those games, when the Falcons put up at least 27 points, Calvin was, was in there. Um, so, so like that's, or 30 point, both of their 30 point games, Calvin, Calvin was in the lineup. He missed that jets game and then he missed the Panthers game and, and the offense kind of dipped back down. So that's big as well. But it's not like we're sitting here talking about a defense that is just blowing plays left and right. We're not sitting here talking about a team that, you know, last couple weeks aside is, is super turnover prone. We're not sitting here talking about a team that's penalty prone and kills itself left and right. We're not even really talking about a team that like blows leads because they haven't, even though they've let some of these leads get tight, 
that's also part of just the nature of the beast in the NFL is these games come down to one possession games like all the time. So I think if you look at just the way the team is playing, each game feels like they're in it at least at some point. And I know that fully well. I'm saying that coming out of a Cowboys blowout, but even that first quarter, like I didn't see a blowout coming second quarter got away from them. And then that was the game. But this team, yes, they're ugly wins and they're ugly wins against bad teams, but it, they're fighting there. It, it's, it's just feels different somehow to the past couple of years where they were the more talented team, but just another dumb thing crept up every single game and you're like, well, what is it this next week that's just going to go horribly wrong? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I necessarily feel that specific feeling about this Falcons team. And in a way, I think that is also progress, is that I, I at least am now starting to feel, okay, sure, they may lose to the Patriots tomorrow night, but I kind of at least expect the first half to, to be a compelling game. Um, you know, I think Atlanta will at least come out and give them a, a, tough, a tough fight. And I do credit like Arthur Smith and, and his coaching staff for that, because it does seem like they have instilled um, a little bit of a new mentality it, on this team and that each game is, is kind of a different game and they don't let things linger from week to week that are problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, they certainly have, I think established sort of a, an identity as this team that's going to win close games. Um, so if they can keep games close, that works out great. Unfortunately, against Dallas, you know that got out of that was out of the question very quickly. Um, but you know, I think that that's an identity that this team hasn't had in who knows how long. So the fact that they've been able to do it, I think, three times already in their four wins, you know, it's it's pretty impressive. So. There's certain aspects of the team so far that I've seen that is, you know, I kind of expected coming into the season. Honestly, looking at the depth chart. I didn't expect this team to be great in the sack department. Um, and obviously they're not. No. They're the worst team in the league in recorded sacks. <laughs> yep. But what I did, what I what I felt was could have been a, a, a considerable plus for them that could have kind of masked that a little bit was just being, you know, somewhat consistent in the takeaway department. Um, if you, you can't get to the quarterback consistently enough. Fine, but if you're getting certain turnovers and you're still trying to put a defense together and get them on one accord with a new scheme, I felt like those turnovers definitely would have helped that progress to an extent. And we haven't really seen that from them this year as well. No. So we're not seeing that aspect of them getting out of the quarterback, and we're not really seeing them turn the ball over at a at a, a comfortable rate as well. So those things I still want to see kind of sort of iron out towards the end of the year. Oh, maybe, yeah. not, maybe not the sacks. Like, I think we already know in our mind. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. They're not going to get after the quarterback on a consistent basis. But, well, man, if we can see, we can see, you know, a couple more interceptions, some more forced fumbles, just something in that particular aspect, I think is going to help this defense move forward. And it's definitely going to give them a little confidence going forward as well. Yeah. You know, and people are mentioning in the chat, you know, we've had a lot of dropped interceptions, like a lot. Right. It reminds me of, I think it was 2018, where they had, I think, like, so many dropped INTs. Like, it was ridiculous. Um, And they do have a ton this year, too. But that's sort of the nature of of turnovers is that they're sort of random. Um, So it's just uh, it's a rough one out there. But they need to start catching those if this defense is going to be good. They're nowhere near good enough to be able to get it done without capitalizing on turnovers that you have in your hands. So (laughs) We we can't see them getting getting at the quarterbacks consistently enough. We're not even seeing them, you know, rack up three and out. So, again, it's this this, to me, this unit as a whole is not talented enough to get a recorded number of stops in a row. Like, they're going to have like in that first half, against Dallas, that fourth down call, which I didn't mind. I don't mind them going for it on fourth and seven early in the game like that. It didn't kill them. Obviously, they lost by 40 points. Like a field goal there really wasn't <laughs> going to do anything. But my my feeling was, man, that's going to hurt because of the fact that this defense is really not going to stop this offense. They're not going to get stops against this talented D- Dallas offense. So that's why I felt like, man, this is – I really just want to see them capitalize on that turnover aspect. That that drop pick by Eric Harris, yeah. who knows? I mean, that could have been a pick six. Considerable moments. Yeah, that was, that was tough. It, like, you go back to the Washington game, drop the pick there in the second half. Ron Harmon dropped the pick. 
in the red zone in the third quarter of that game. They end up Washington ended up scoring on the next play. Remember, they forced the fumble against Terry McLaurin, Terry McLaurin on that final drive as well that they couldn't recover. It's just like, guys, I know you can't be world yeah. beaters on defense, but when you have these opportunities, you got to get them. You that, gotta get them better. That's what made uh, what's made Dallas's defense, at least around the league, kind of well known for right. being a good defense. Um, yeah. go, I don't yeah. know what it currently and- is, but. They're like 18 going in, scoring. Like they're not well, going you know, against yeah. in, going into the Falcons game. Um, both their starting corners ha- gave up in digs and uh, I believe it's Anthony Brown gave mm-hmm. up the most yards in coverage like this mm-hmm. season, yeah. well, like the top two in the entire league. So they were giving up the most yards, but it doesn't matter because they're getting turnovers. And then in this upcoming game, um, the Patriots alone have uh, three players on the roster who have more interceptions than the Falcons do. Um, so it's like... <laughs> Dallas Dallas is 26 in yards per play allowed, 23rd in red zone efficiency. But you wouldn't really know about the ball. They, right. They limit, they limit possessions <laughs> because they get the turnovers. So... But that's, really that's the key it. thing. That's the key thing here with Atlanta is, you know, when we... Like, we should put a pin in this thought and then revisit it after the season because if this is a if this is a first season thing that happened, but then, you know, likes turnovers can, it reverts back to the mean in a good way for Atlanta. Then you start getting tough because they are four and five with all of these things not going in their favor. And usually you would, for a, a team to be kind of an underdog and, and to a less talented team to knock off a better team, usually sacks, turnovers are part of that story. These big yep. negative defensive plays that mm-hmm. help keep them in a game. Falcons really haven't gotten those, which is in a way like weirdly more impressive to me is that again, they're still finding ways to be in these games late Dallas aside and their first two games aside. But by and large, the reason we were all kind of feeling pretty good about the Falcons is they were like kind of in these games and they were doing that without getting those turnovers or those sacks. So if this, if this is a first half kind of thing and then everybody's clicking then you start to really get some dark horse noise if the wins start to stack up because you're making some of these impact plays, say against Tampa Bay, a a sack fumble again against Tom Brady. Maybe you win that game this time because of that. Uh, But if we look back and we say, no, that was a season-long trend, then I think we're really looking more at the kind of like 6-11, and and 7-10 season because Mm -hmm. these offenses they're about to play, like they're too good to let them just have all of their allotted possessions Mm -hmm. and really try to do like the bend and don't break, like, yeah, that these offenses are going to just eat them alive, like like Dallas did. So yeah, that's definitely got to change. But but that's where it's a good thing to check in on at the midway point because those are two stats that will, and probably more the turnovers and the sacks. I agree with you, Eric. Like I don't really expect that to get because that's just not as random, right? Yeah. Right. Um, but but yeah, if, if the turnovers really kind of swing back in Atlanta's favor over the second half of the season, I mean that's the X factor, I think, in my mind for how this yeah. year plays out. Yeah, because, I mean, you, you're, you're looking at a team, and, and Kevin and I, we, we brought this up a few weeks back. You're looking at a team, and, and I know they did it against inferior opponents, but you're looking at a team that's, that's finding a way, finding ways to win games late, which, which yep. was not yep. the norm in seasons before. Yes. Um, you know, and, and I, I see it, yeah, they had a game-winning kick against the Giants. They had a game-winning kick against the Dolphins. I get it. But again, these were games under Dan Quinn that they were losing. And he somehow, some way, without being able to get to the quarterback consistently, without being able to cause turnovers, they found a way to win these games. I don't I don't care the opponent. So uh, to, to your to your credit there, Will, like, yeah, it, it's it's gonna be interesting to see if they can fix that one particular facet as the season goes on, because because of the fact like, hey, they're finding ways to win games late. If they can turn that on a little bit. And that's why that matters, right? Because right. like when we sit here and say in week three, yeah, yeah, it was an ugly win. Sure, we don't necessarily feel better about the team, but it's a win that they've banked. Yeah. And that's, that, this right here is the point of saying that back in week three. It's because yeah. they've done the bare minimum to stay in contention right. and given themselves as much time as possible for something like that to click. Right. And maybe... Who knows? Tomorrow night, maybe it clicks and this team finds a kind of a new identity and boom, we're off to the races. Probably right. not going to happen, but we don't <laughs> know. 
but but those close, ugly, gritty wins at the beginning right. of the season on the the leg of Young Way Koo, three of right. those four. I mean, he's the MVP of the season this year so far. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I, they've done enough to put themselves in this spot for us to even be having this conversation. Because, because how, p- given how the season has played out, you can at least say that if that particular aspect was working for them, they'll be a game above 500 right now. They would have right. beat Washington if mm-hmm. they were able to close on those opportunities, and it would be 5-4 and yeah. four instead of 4-5 and five right now. So, again, right. cover kickoffs. Well, <laughs> yeah. That, too. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's not as if we're – because – I think our, our outlook is definitely realistic when it comes to this team and, and how they play so far going forward. We're not expecting them to be world beaters. I don't expect them to really, like you said, flip the switch against a well-coached Patriots team. Um, yeah. But it's just looking at that one particular aspect, especially on the defensive side of the ball. If they can fix that, they may be able to turn these close games, these games that they're able to to stay you know, in relatively – you know relatively competitive nature with like they they can turn these things into wins because again they're they're finding ways to win games without making those game changing plays late that you yeah. see the teams make which yeah. is which is impressive yeah yeah i mean i think you know we said i think going into this stretch new orleans dallas new england this is going to be you know one of the toughest three game slates that they play all year if not the toughest um so i think you know, we were like, they need to like win one of these games to stay in it. You know, four and six is workable. Three and seven, not workable. They won the first one. They did beat New Orleans. So it, they can they can afford to lose to New England, which let's all be honest here. They're probably going to lose to New England. Uh, <laughs> they're probably going to lose to New England. So um, they're not out of it at that point. But, you know. It really, to me, depends on how they look against New England. Because if you get wiped out, similar to how you got wiped out by the last playoff team team you faced, I'm uh, not. I'm not going to be sure that I'm going to watch that game. To be honest with you, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, I I'm contractually obligated, so I have to. Mr. ESPN Eric over here, he's not. You I'm know, just, his I'm blood just, contract has expired with <laughs> the Falcons. Just but, big yeah. national over here. Just, yeah. yeah. I'm just tired of, I mean, because I already know, like, the Super Bowl 51 stuff. It's just going to be regurgitated mm-hmm. over and over and over and over. Is this Al Is this Al and Chris Collinsworth again? Who's their Thursday night? <laughs> no. It's, oh, it's, this is Joe oh, Buck and Troy Aikman. And Troy. Which and is you somehow know, worse. You <laughs> know <laughs> Joe Buck will find a way. But, but I would have just, I would have just, Chris Collinsworth just going, well, Al, I got to tell you, Bill Belichick, it just, you want to see what a great coach is. You go back to that Super Bowl game. You flip on this. Like, I just can't. You do flip that on the oh, tape. You turn you that game Joe, on. You think Joe's going to do that? Oh, yeah, remember the last I, I two just, teams, I, last mm-hmm. time these two teams know. played. Well, last time <laughs> team, these two teams were on the field and we did a game, Troy. This happened. Oh, well, Falcons thanks. fans, look away because we're about to show you 10, 15 oh. minutes of, fa- of Super Bowl highlights. 28 to 3. That's quite yeah. a familiar score, isn't <laughs> that, it? That's going to happen. Oh, that's yeah. Happening oh, regardless. Yeah, I mean, but people don't realize, yeah. like, that, that that doesn't hurt us anymore. Like, Falcons fans it don't give a shit it's about that. It, it, it is. It's, it's annoying. still annoying. It's, like, like, all right. it, it's not Guys, guys the Braves just won a World Series. Can yeah, we, like, yeah. let's enjoy that. Seconds, just have, like, a little bit of, of imperviousness to our souls? I mean, I know we can't. I know the answer is no, but. No, just... no, but you know, it's, it's whatever, you know, we, we just have to get over it as Falcons fans. Uh, but yeah, I mean, on the topic of the, I don't think they're out of it, but they need to at least put on like a respectable game against the Patriots. Cause if they don't, I think it's like, well, maybe they could technically make the playoffs cause the NFC like wildcard race is kind of a disaster. Um, Guys, if, if they get smoked by the, if they get smoked by the Pats, I'm like, I'm ready think, to say that this is not a playoff team. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't think they're really um, like a like well, traditional like playoff team. Those are too bad, Will. They're still in the hunt. <laughs> they're, they're gonna be in the hunt for a while <laughs> in this I NFC. think yeah. the Panthers are seven right now, so yeah. it's like yeah. they're not gonna make the playoffs. Even no, probably not. It's Panthers probably for the best that they don't. But even if but they, they win to, even that's if they why win they tomorrow. might do it. That's why I think they That's could exactly do it. why. Because They'll just do it because we said it. Yeah. Just just to prove us wrong. Don't want to see they win tomorrow night. they're not you, well, I again, mean, the if they path is there. Night, I'm gonna, I'll feel better. But the, knowing this team, this team is doomed to be just eight and nine. Yeah, I mean, like, they're, they're probably gonna, gonna be. They're just in gonna win, range. loss, win, loss, win, loss all year long. 
basically that that's my prediction. Still got to play the Jags and Lions. I don't like for the record. I don't think they belong in the playoffs, but I think that's why I think they're going to do it. Just because they have some fairly because like, they have no like, business being there. And they're you're like, gonna think, okay. just, you're gonna just think troll gonna, the NFL. You, you think they're gonna they're gonna make? I think they could squeak in as a seven. They absolutely can. You know, I just the, don't the know NFC if they is will. Top yeah. heavy. Yeah, it's so it top heavy. They still have to play the the I think Lions. Last week before the Jags. Dallas, I think last week before Dallas, their projected playoff game was going to be like against the Cardinals. Do we really want to see that? No, it's probably no, going to be against Packers. Dallas again. I do. It's, it's, it'll be yes, funny. I do. Or, Matt Ryan's first season, Dallas. the Cardinals yeah. beat the Falcons. I want no, the Falcons will. now to go oh, back no. in there and Matt no, Ryan's no, last wow. season and no, knock will. them off. No, Will, we're not going to do that. <laughs> yep. That's the What's thing. Up? I'm saying I don't think they belong there at all, but that's why I think they're going to do it. Just because to make yeah. us all look terrible. Because NFL keeps expanding it and they <laughs> yep. want – Teams that just, don't belong there to be there. Uh, It'll be eight teams just before about that, that, the we're TV. Gonna get another, we're just going to get another twenty-four to two. Like we just, yeah, that's what the NFL wants. <laughs> Wait till there's eight seeds. There you go. It's only a matter of time. Wait till yeah, there's dude, forty. College teams. football playoff yeah. blowouts in the first round. We got baseball blowouts in the first. It's just sports. They love blowouts in the first round of yeah, things. Yeah, but why does it have to happen to our team, Will? Why can't it just happen to somebody? Well, because. <laughs> It's not like we do better in the other rounds historically either. We're right, well, but still, it's, it's just, I just look at it as another way, another another opportunity to make fun of the Falcons. Ha ha ha! Look at them; they made the playoffs. All right, so mm-hmm. so, so Eric, you you've got a you've got an option here. Let's say they you've got you can pick between six and eleven or nine and eight, and they sneak in with a tie break as the seven six seed. And <laughs> six and eleven, really, and you really would just be like, cool, thirteenth. Yes. I hope they because pick higher nine, than 13th. Because again, because again <laughs> nine and eight, they're going to get in and knowing their luck, they're going to have their first game is going to be against Aaron Rodgers. It'll be Dallas again. Yeah, it'll be, <laughs> Dallas. It'll be Dallas again. <laughs> They'll get smoked by 45. And then it's like, oh, let's pick at the Falcons one more time before they call it a season, guys. Like, it's just, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I hate making the playoffs for the sake of making the playoffs. Like, if you make the playoffs, I want you to have a genuine opportunity to have a run. And let's be quite honest here. Even if they make the playoffs, these guys are just looking at what the NFC has in front of them, from the Packers to the Cowboys to the Cardinals. Eric, you were never read David and Goliath as a kid. Were you? <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want to see these guys play the Rams in Hell. round one? Yeah, mm-hmm. dude, I absolutely freaking do because they would be in there in the playoffs, which is something well, that they haven't been in since 2017. So, like, sure, the, the narrative would be fun. is that they're still losing and that they're not in the playoffs. So, like, if it's one more game, that's fine. But, like, at least you're a playoff team and that is progress and you're one for Arthur Smith. Like, I, I'm i okay with Will's scenario, but that's I don't want them to, like... meaningful. I like that, but I don't want them to be doing this crap where they're like, we're going to shit the bed every other week and then, like pull out last second field goals the other half of the time and limp into the playoffs at nine and eight and then get our ass blasted, you know, the by only, Dallas again. The only team uh, to get shut out <laughs> you guys have been, so, I thought I was like jaded and well, no. you guys have been like totally beaten down by this. We have. Yes. Franchise. But and now you see it from our perspective. You know, <laughs> but just, I mean, I know I understand it and I feel it, but like different. when you've been scarred for so long, it's just <laughs> but like what, like after, all right. So after the Super Bowl, like, like really a, like a, a wild card weekend loss is going to send you into a, a spiral. Like uh, that's yeah. it's not going to send me in a spiral. It's, it's just like nothing can knowing, hurt me anymore. It's just, knowing, <laughs> it's just knowing how, that you're knowing how the public views the way that the public view the Falcons now anyway and knowing their history knowing that in these in these big time games where they have the national spotlight on them they but that wouldn't be a big time game I mean that that would be well, I mean it, it would be, be funny the, because I mean, sure, they, it's, it's a there's no way you can game, choke like, if you're like a 15 point underdog so exactly like it's all <laughs> upside for you there they and, find a way They'd find a way. Like, yeah, you know, probably, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it would be a Houston Texans, Kansas City Chiefs deal where the yeah. Falcons would get up on the Packers 25 to 3. And then, you know, I, <laughs> like, why did I say 3 yeah. in there? At least I didn't oh, say 28. No. Yeah, there you um, go. It's so, God, it's so Freudian. Just you guys want to rush into the brain now. But I, I'm okay. Like, I like the 9 and 8 scenario, but I want them to actually start just like playing legitimately better to where they like sure. have a strong second half. 
they're playing more consistently and better. And, like, they get into the playoffs and, like, they feel like they at least, like, belong there. Even if it's like, oh, yeah, they were lucky to make the playoffs. But, like, I just feel like, like they be belong here. a little bit, you know. I mean, there's still some, ge- like, if they beat the Bills somehow. I mean, the Jags did it, so it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> but they would have to win games like that. Like, yeah, I mean, to, to, get to, get to, to get to 9-8, and eight, they'd have to win, you know, what, five more of the next game. eight. Yeah, they had that opportunity to win a game like that this past Sunday. Well, that didn't. Yeah, go so but well, but if but, they yeah. win, if they win five of their next, uh, what is that, eight? Yeah, five of their next eight. Like with this schedule and the strength, like we are, that would automatically mean I think that we are feeling better about this team going into the playoffs. Now, sure, if they're still two point wins over whatever, a two point win over the Bucks and a two point win over the Bills and a two point yeah, win over yeah. the Patriots, like. Those are two point wins I can get behind. Oh, you know, no, like, I'm not, goes, I'm not giving goes. caveats oh, about that. I just, I, I just, I don't know. I think we, if we're nine and eight, and we're all four back here doing this, talking <laughs> about a, a wild card weekend game, I'm pretty sure we're going to find a way to talk ourselves into the Falcons having a chance. Well, yeah, I mean, I and think as if they get to nine and eight, yeah. As long as we're not playing Dallas that weekend, we're probably not talking much about that game, anyways. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, but I'm if, always... we're, if we're playing Dallas, then that's going to come up every three seconds. So, yeah, right. The NFL is not the NBA. Uh, tanking is not is not like the proven way to do. Oh, like, no. Sure, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for tanking, but I'm also a big advocate for program building. And I just see much more upside in a. It'll help you convince some of these veteran guys that are on one year contracts that a. What we're building here is actually worth a damn. Uh, you've been a part of that. We would like for you to continue to be, and you try to get their buy in to, to come back. Um, and then just for the younger guys, all the guys they drafted, somebody like Kyle Pitts. Hey, you were one of the top offensive options as a rookie for a playoff team that wasn't expected to finish up there. You helped them completely turn around from 2020 to 2021. Uh, you know, I just think there's much more upside and value. Again, long term, I don't think they're winning a Super Bowl this year, but only one team is. So Right. Every team is going to be disappointed at the end of the season. I'd rather be disappointed with a uh, an Atlanta Falcons 2021 wild card shirt in my closet than <laughs> another six and eleven shirt in my closet. It, right. <laughs> yes, you. It, it would definitely be <clears throat> as far as the organization goes, and especially in year one for Arthur Smith, with how the season started right. for him to turn the team into a wild card team. It would be a great story. I'm just so concerned with not even knowing what Falcons team we're going to get week in and week out in a regular season that I'm definitely not certain what, what we're going to see in a wild card round in the playoff. We can definitely see a team that in that second half of the Bucks game, we're only down by three going into the fourth quarter. Right. But we can also see a team like what we saw on Sunday. Right. Yeah. And and that and, and that is what concerns me, and that is what I because I I would feel as if like okay if they if they're given another opportunity in a playoff setting to prove themselves against those type of teams, and they lay an egg like that, like what is that really going to tell you? Like okay, yeah. they're really far apart than we actually, even though they made the same playoff setting as all these other other teams when it was time to buckle the chin strap and get out on the field and play and get a win and they get beat by the Rams 45 and nothing. And we're looking at it like, okay, but, but we already know that. I like, I, I think <laughs> that doesn't change any of the information we just had here. And we just talked about how this roster is like, just kind of so far. It's the grand Canyon between the Cowboys and the yep. Falcons. That's like, I'm not disputing that. And I totally would sit there and watch the Falcons get beaten 33 to 14 on a, on a wild card weekend and I'll take that loss. That's fine. Because again, I think it's about not the year one of it all, the year three of it all. And just correct. Like my expectations this year are that the Falcons are not winning the Super Bowl. I don't think any of us here, I don't think anybody on the planet oh, no, outside oh, of maybe Arthur Smith and Matt Ryan think the Falcons actually have a shot at winning the Super Bowl, but that's their job. That's not ours. Yeah. I just actually on that- on Mike. Yeah, maybe odd not. Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, yeah. Between the Hawks, the Braves, and the uh, Falcons, man, he's somebody watch out. We uh, never see but... him again if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> just he'll become the Twizzler King in the Bahamas. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. No, yeah, I just, I mean, I'm not debating that 
yeah, I don't think the Falcons, if they make the playoffs, all of a sudden we're sitting there looking at them stacked up against the Packers as like the odds on favorites. I just think that it, somebody's got to make that playoff spot. Why not us? Didn't Washington make it last year? Yeah. 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 That'd be and they almost beat the Bucks too. probably goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they almost beat the Bucks. Yeah. So like if they get to nine and eight, that'll mean like, I think if they get to nine and eight, I think we're, ha- that we have a very different view of this team because you know, Jaguars, 49ers, Lions. You got, you're right. You got to see the rest you know, of the schedule. Like, the right. only, there's only two quote-unquote gimmies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's like and Jags and Lions. 49ers are almost as Jekyll and Hyde as the Falcons, so maybe that's the third one. They also play really bad at home, and it is in San Francisco. Um, so, you like, the Panthers again. You get the Panthers again. You get the Saints again. You get the Bucks and the Patriots So like, and the Bills. So, like, you have to – you have to win those, you know, games where you might have a chance to be favored, like Jacksonville, Detroit, maybe San Francisco, and then you also have to pick up two wins from New England, Tampa Bay, Carolina, Buffalo, New Orleans. So, Woof. you have to win two of those to get to nine and eight. So, if I, I think if they do, then it's yes. like, oh well, this team we're probably thinking a lot differently of this team. But uh, <laughs> if they, you know. So if they get to nine and eight, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, we're probably more confident than we are now because they would have had to have win, won several games against teams that aren't just bad teams to get there. So I guess that may that may be the premise of my argument: the fact that I don't feel comfortable at all saying that they can even win enough games to get to a nine and eight record. I know you guys probably sort you you guys kind of sort of foresee that like it is possible. I mean, math, it's math, a scenario. It's it's just anything's possible. Yeah, right. It's, just, like that, I'm, it's, I'm, a, it's a thought exercise. I'm yeah. looking at the schedule and I'm looking at the teams that are, you know, that, that await the Falcons going forward. And then I just, I can't help. I know it's probably, and to be honest with you, this past Sunday was probably a fluke, to be honest with you. It was a 40 point loss. I mean, as, as many times as they've, they've lost in recent years. I don't even recall a game where they just got wiped off the floor like that. Well, Patterson was injured. He only played 15 And then Patterson snaps. was injured. Yeah, if you so had was, Ridley, I mean, right. it could have so been a little closer. It might not. I don't know if they would have won. Guys, but that was just been more an of a game. Right. It was like just a old-fashioned ass Yeah, But yeah. I, just, I just can't look at the schedule and then look at that and say, okay, you know what? They're going to hit their stride at some point. I, I just feel. Oh, I, I feel definitely don't. Certain think things that's... are going to align for them in a certain way. They're going to get Ridley back, you know, yeah. at, a, at the right time, like right before that Carolina game. Ridley's going to come back, or right before the Niners game. Ridley's going to be back, and they're going to go on a run, and he's going to be ready. Like it's, it's kind of hard for me to look at that. I just, I, I don't think anybody should think that's going to happen because I, I would oh, bet yeah. anything that it's not but, going but nobody to. Thought- yeah, nobody thought Calvin Ridley was going to miss time for what he's missing time right. for. Nobody thought right. Cal- Corderell Patterson was going to explode and become like the best offensive player in the league. So, yes, we're we're not sitting here, Evan. I, I think this was the point you're about to make. So I'll just let you yeah. make it. Like we're I don't. Oh no, I was just going to say like I think we all feel differently. Like let's say they beat the Bills, um, they beat the Patriots, obviously, so- and then maybe they beat the Bucks or something. Like they end up beating some of these teams that they have no business probably even being in competition with we probably feel different and we probably don't end up looking back at the Dallas game so much because they've shown they can be some of these tough games. I mean, Dallas, in my opinion, is the best team in the league. Like, and they were going into that game. I love what they have on offense defense. They're missing some pieces. They get those back. They could be undefeated right now. They were yeah, a few so, bad. So they needed game. Michael Gallup back this past week. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Funding some talent over there. Well, oh, let me yeah. ask you guys this then. This might be a better better question. Let's say the, the nine and eight thing does happen. Realistically, what goes right for this team in order for that to happen? I mean turnovers. Pro- probably they start <laughs> catching those turnovers. Ridley comes back and the offense like actually starts, you know, dropping 30 plus on a weekly basis. That's probably I think what the, that means. The biggest difference aside from like the obvious stuff like Ridley is if they're able to get a like a consistent run game. Like if they just commit to Gallman, which I don't know if they're actually going to do, but I think the Mike Davis experiment's just kind of like let's let Gallman. He showed something last week. I thought at least on the eye test. I know stats wise, he had the second highest rushing game 
on the season. I think Patterson had a 60 yard game against the Dolphins, but like Davis hasn't had more than uh, Gallman. And I know it was junk change, but still, like I thought he looked. Yeah, I thought he looked good enough to like, hey, let's see what he can do. Yeah, I mean, Smith said in his press conference that Gallman only got that many carries because you know they were on a short week and it was a blowout. Yeah, his, so yeah. Maybe he did but Davis with wasn't getting that even if it, 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 well, yeah, exactly. been saying for weeks anyway. Gallman should be featured a little yeah. more. Yeah, but yeah, um, what about you? No, uh, like realistically, yeah. what do you think will go? Will have to go right for them to go nine and eight? By, by the season? honestly, I mean, and and this is the most kind of boring coach speak answer, but but I think it's true. And I think it goes back to my earlier point about when you look uh, at, at kind of the games individually and, and from week to week, they're in the, these games. Right. And yeah, I'm even thinking back to the to the close wins against that. Like in each of those games, there were moments where I thought to myself, like, holy crap, this ha- this Falcon scene actually looks good. Like they're they're up double digits against the Jets or they're up. You yeah. know, they I really think for as close as that Miami Dolphins game was. Like I came away from that game feeling really good about the Falcons. Um, oh, they, and yeah, then they dominated the Saints, for three and a half quarters. Just about. yeah, yeah. It's, you're up 18 points against the Saints, like on the road. This right. team has done that. So, my answer to your question is, I think that it's just finding ways to put that together for four quarters. But this team has made every game its own game, and that is what a coach will tell you each week. Is like the last week doesn't matter. Two weeks from now doesn't matter. We're worried about Sunday and you can see such a fluctuation in one team's performance to the next, because a whole new team, you're a, a brand new opponent. You're going up against a new game plan. I think that the, the reason I'm excited, the Falcons are, are in all of these games blow. I know we're coming off of the worst loss of the season, which is why I think uh, there's a tinge of pessimism in, in terms of where they really stack up again. Cause it's kind of like, They've played two big boys this year. They've lost to both of them. And the most recent loss is was a 40 point loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I get where you guys are coming from with that. But I just think that continuing to, you know, what Arthur Smith has done, the reason these games are all close, I think they've come in with really good game plans on a lot of these teams. I think the good teams, you know, kind of like what we were talking about with the Stefanski and the and the Bill Belichick, it, like so much of the preparation coming in uh happens during the week. And I've not yet seen a Falcons game outside of the Eagles game where I was just kind of like, what are they like? It looks like they totally weren't really prepared for the game that they're about to play. I can't even the, even the Cowboys game. That was just, it just got out of hand so quickly in so many ways, like more on the, on the offensive side, they couldn't, they had just a bad luck and and like the defense to me, it was a little bit real. They like, they allowed all those touchdowns. So that's worrying, but it was the first time the defense had really been steamrolled like that. So yeah. I, I just I'm I'm thinking that if you if you continue to do the little small incremental things like that all adds up to to beating a team like the Patriots to beating a team like the Bucks. I mean, we saw the game plan against the Chiefs last year, like for an individual game, they came in with the right mentality, with the right game plan and made a couple of plays. Mm-hmm. And so I think that ultimately it's going to kind of come down to that. Like, I don't know if it it takes all of a sudden. Sure, they could use a couple more like. X factor players like Corderell Patterson, like his emergence is really what allowed this team to be four and five right now. Yeah. So I would love to see, and AJ Terrell as well, I would say are are kind of the two guys, Matt Ryan's played well, but like if you get a Mike Davis to start kind of finding his stride, or if you get a Grady to, to get a couple of sacks in one game, game, which we know he's capable of doing or, or Eric Harris starts holding on to some of the, all it takes is really like one or two other guys to really step up. Mm-hmm. And I think this team rises up a level and is, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> and is is able to then now be in like competitive games with the Patriots and with the Bucks and with uh, the the Bills, like because I I think they've shown the ability so far to keep these games close, and they've also shown the ability to win some of these close games. So I don't know. I could just see a scenario where it's kind of like everything that they've been doing, they just maybe take it up like two notches. Right. And just like not not because anything magical happened, just because they've continued to improve throughout the year. So that would be my answer is, is I think it's something more along the lines of that than any magical like just Im- stuff improve happening. slightly. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> Boring answer. But... <laughs> no, no, no. Just improve slightly on the positives that they've already shown. Yeah. Win four games on this season. Right. Basically is what yeah. you're saying. Well, you're not saying I mean, they don't need to become a juggernaut overnight because realistically that's that's not going to happen that's course. not possible yeah. right yeah but you're just yeah. saying like hey maybe 
if a couple key players here and there just kind of turn up the play just a little bit, it may lead a domino effect where, hey, if Mike Davis starts stepping up in the performance, you may see the run game kind of go off a little bit for Gallman, or you you may see the passing game benefit from it a little bit because of that aspect. Or even even something as simple as um, oh, I'm totally blank on the name, but I know I know you guys get it. Uh, Terry McLaurin scoring that touchdown in the back of the end zone against Washington when right. when Taylor when Taylor Heineke was basically scrambling for his life, finds a dude standing in the back. I Make wanted to say wide wide open, but no, he was double covered. <laughs> yeah. And he still managed to make that yeah. catch. So so even like the little incremental improvements, like knocking that ball down, getting a field goal there, and and that game may turn out totally differently. So mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's it's the it's the stated mission that Arthur Smith said kind of from day one. Like I don't know if any of this like they kind of put out their mission statement early on, which was look, we're gonna try to compete in every game. You know, we know where we're at, we just want to get better every week. And kind of that's what I've seen from this team so far. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, can't can't complain there. Yeah, I mean, thanks, guys, for all of your in-depth takes about the direction of this team. And we're certainly all <laughs> hoping for more good things going forward than bad things. Uh, before we get out of here, I want to read off a couple of final donations from Corey Carter with the $5. Thank you so much, Corey. He says, if we can steal another win tomorrow, we are set up for a much better second half. We need to get one of those losses back to Washington and the Panthers because five and five is about where we should be. Uh, totally agree with you, Corey. Um, you know, they do need to steal some games. Like that's how this is going to work. They're going to have to beat some, some teams that they're not supposed to beat if they want to be competitive here. Um, and then finally from Solaire, we got one, the $1 thanks again, Solaire for that. He says, Come on, guys, the seventh seed versus the second seed. That would be the Nickelodeon playoff game. You're telling me you don't want to see Matty Ice yes. get slimed? <laughs> Ice for MVP. So, hey, we can keep that in the back of our heads. You know, look at we have the Nickel- we'd have the Nickelodeon playoff game, the first one ever, right? So, uh, Are they guess, doing that? I, I, I remember think, they I, did I, a Nickelodeon game. Uh, they did it last year. What? It wouldn't have been the, They did it last yeah. year. It was true. The, the Bears, the Bears and the Bucks. Saints. Uh, yeah. Saints. Yeah, yeah, Bears and Saints. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, so. oh, man, Tony Romo was just, like, crushing, I think, Mitch Trubisky that entire afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Uh-oh. So but, maybe, uh, you know, hopefully, Eric, to your point, I don't want to see that for Matt Ryan. So maybe yeah. we should oh. avoid that game. Maybe maybe we should, yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, I hate to kind of harp back on to this, man, but it, and you guys probably see it too, but the organization as a whole has just turned into a giant laughing stock, and it's, it's yeah. embarrassing. I mean, it's – is not on the level as what the Cleveland Browns have endured or the Lions have endured. But even at the, like, again, it's nowadays you see it. And I see it even, even at ESPN. Like when you say the Falcons name, there's a, there's a chuckle that comes out right after you say the Falcons, <laughs> the Falcons. Like it's just, it's, I hate. They just have to get back to looking like a competitive team. I mean, the Bills yeah, lost right. four straight Super Bowls. Winning, but nobody winning these games it. is one thing, but Jesus, <laughs> just. Like to me, that's the that's ultimate. Cool. Like, oh, like the Bills losing four straight Super Bowls. Yeah, but nobody oh, ever yeah. talks about it. <laughs> yeah, it's old news now. We, so. Yeah, can we mention uh, or or point out the fact that Eric just said even at ESPN, as though it's not literally the worldwide leader of sports, <laughs> <laughs> even at this little you know, network. Humble brag. Oh, yeah, yeah, my little local cable station. Even here. in my like my my third or fourth group chat, they're talking about it. Like, <laughs> not even my main one. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> oh man. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Yep. But it. All but right. Eric did yeah. confirm ESPN hates us. So. That's true. That's true. They hate the Falcons. Yeah. They don't they hate, hate the bias. Falcons. <laughs> the Falcons are they just punching, the Falcons are just a punching bag. Like we were right. we were talking about them in a meeting the other day, and Marcus Spears didn't even want to talk about the Falcons. He was like, "Let's move on." Like, <laughs> let's just move on. Yeah. And Quinn did what he needed to do. Let's move on. I'm like, God damn. They don't want to say anything about the Falcons, man. It's just, but that's yeah. kind of the approach we took. Well, yeah. Yeah. True, <laughs> I mean, it was just enough. such a bad game. There's yeah. really not anything to talk about. But well, he's somebody in general. Like, there's no discussion. Even when the Falcons were playing good and Matt Ryan was, you know, after that Saints game, they still didn't want to talk about him. I'm like, guys, they just went on the road and beat the Saints. Like, we, are we not going to at least try yeah. to mention them in right. a segment somehow? Yeah. Nah. Cool. Nah. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't talk about that team. Yeah. All right. 
too sure. boring. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. But uh, no, that that's our midseason review, guys. That's our TNF preview. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if all goes well, we'll have a, uh, a Thursday night post game tomorrow night. Uh, I did just get my COVID booster today. So we'll see if I am still, you know, functional tomorrow night late after the TNF game. If I am, we'll have the post game show then. If not, we'll have it probably Friday or something like that. But I'll keep I you guys posted on that. Well, yeah. Game. It may also be, you know, that the game is so bad that I, I literally can't, you know, make it through. So uh, and I may just conveniently blame the COVID booster at that point. But, um, you know, I'm setting it up now so that I have that option. But more than likely we'll have the uh, show tomorrow night. But if not, it'll probably be Friday. Um, before we get out of here, I want to remind you guys again, check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Live. Please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. You can check out the community Discord server. The link to that is in the show description here. Uh, and I just want to thank all my excellent guests this evening. First of all, we have with us Will McFadden. He is at Will McFadden on the Twitters and host of the Believe Falcons podcast. Will, uh, tell people where they can get the podcast and anything else you want to plug. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, wherever you uh, get any of your podcasts, say the you line, can probably well, yeah. find, uh, <laughs> find ours. But um, yeah, where, wherever your podcasts are sold. Um, no, uh, yeah, believe, believe in Falcons, B L E A V. Uh, Co host is Ovi Mahaley. Ever heard of him? Uh, <laughs> former Falcons fullback and all pro. Um, really great guy. So yeah, we, we usually record twice a week, not, not this week, um, obviously, but. Yep, you can catch us out or catch us wherever you get your stuff. And then, yeah, I will McFadden and Stock Up, Stock Down. Big, big hit on the Falcoholic. What's up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, big uh, time. <laughs> Mostly we'll, Stock I Down this probably, week. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah whew, it was a, yeah, not a great way to, a time to have a Stock Up segment, but that'll probably come out on Friday, I think, after the game, even though it usually runs on Mondays. Cool, cool. So that's good. We also have with us. Special guest, Eric Robinson. He is at underscore Eric underscore Robinson. Eric, tell people where they can find your stuff, what you've been up to, anything else you want to plug. You can you can find me on Twitter, definitely. Uh, you just put out the Twitter handle. Um, yep, yep. We don't have much to plug. You know, I work at ESPN. You know, I'm big time yeah, now. Okay. Yeah. You can plug that. I work, in a, I work in a dark highlight room, man. It's not even, <laughs> you can catch me. That's get where the magic tomorrow. happens. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even what you guys think. It's where it's the magic a, happens. I'm in, a dark, I'm in a dark screening room with like three <laughs> computers in front of me for nine hours. Yep. Is yeah. Living the I'm dream. Really away. <laughs> Everybody's got to start somewhere. One of these days, you're going to be on first take or something. We're going to be yep. like, remember when he used to. Yeah, Stephen A is going to call out sick, and they're like, is there anyone out there can, that can deliver hot takes today? And Eric's going to be like, I like to deliver hot takes, and then he's going to be out there. It'll be just like Ricky Bobby. And then, <laughs> that'll be it. Uh, then... Talking about the Falcons for that to work, Eric. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Be... I got to yep. take the Falcons are going to make the playoffs this year. Marcus Spears is there like you go. this guy. Oh, my, oh, my God. Yep, there, yep. We get to watch Eric on TV just, oh, no. <laughs> every now and then, every now and then I'm in, the, I'm in the, the studio. It's pretty cool, man. It really yeah, is. I imagine. Very that's cool. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Also with us tonight, Director of Guest Personnel. He is Evan Birchfield, at Evan Birchfield on the Twitters. Evan, anything you're working on you'd like to plug? Um. No, just go to thefalcock.com. Um, one thing, I guess, to plug in general is uh, I know the uh, Pro Bowl is a joke and nobody watches it, but um, v- voting's open. Uh, guys like A.J. Terrell deserve to be at yeah, least selected sure. mm-hmm. um, because I-, I put a tweet on Twitter about how, you know, Terrell's allowed the fewest yards per reception and Marcus Lattimore's allowed – or not Marcus, Marshawn Lattimore's allowed the most – uh, yards per per reception, it's like twenty even. Um, and Marshawn Lattimore is going to be selected to the Pro Bowl. Trail probably won't be unless everyone gets out and votes. <laughs> like it's a clear difference, but it's a popularity contest. You know what? For the hell of it, vote for Cordero too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think, I, I, I think Patterson will make Chris it. Yeah. I think There's Patterson will make young it. Way yeah. to, you know, for the hell of it. Yeah. Oh, Young, young Way is a is oh, a version Young of Way. Law. Yeah, definitely. But that's what I mean. He, young Way is Young yeah, Way's going to lead it. all players in vote getting. Right. Just you watch. Well, he's got the national like, <laughs> you know, they they like him at the national yeah. level. But like Terrell's not getting. Dude, he's gonna he's gonna have like sixty million fan votes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Young Wei is. Oh yeah, so everybody just, loves uh, Young Wei Koo. And Patterson too, honestly, the fantasy plays into it. And Patterson as this sort of like mm-hmm. dynamic fantasy player, I think that will help him get in as well. But, you know, maybe but like Pitts Lindstrom just, and Terrell like, could use it. Pitts, yeah. Pitts might get it just because the NFC And there's is, no tight ends like, in the NFC. Hawkinson, yeah. who literally did, had zero catches last week, yep. is the only so, one who's like competitive with him in the NFC. All the other tight ends are in the AFC. So Pitts yeah. should make it. But vote nice. anyways. Just, you know, yeah, you vote, for, your vote for you guys you like. Yeah. Yeah, Lindstrom definitely deserves it as well, but it's hard for offensive yeah, line to make yeah. it if they're not on a winning team, honestly. Right. So um, that's why it's important to get out and you know not get out and vote, but get vote out and vote. Home. Yeah, I'm like get out to the polls. Get, get out and vote. Get out and vote. Hello, I'm here to convince you to vote for. Uh, I'm here with the AJ Terrell for for the Pro Bowl <laughs> committee. Uh, can we count Evan, on Evan your vote? The, the, Evan's the Stacey Abrams of the uh, Atlanta give me a Pro Bowl sticker. <laughs> I voted for Pro Bowl. Yeah. Pro Bowl. <laughs> All right, guys. Again, nice. thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in, uh, putting up with our shenanigans, among other things. Putting up with this team. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Uh, like I said, we'll be probably be back tomorrow night after Thursday night football. If not, it'll probably be uh, Friday for the post game, and then we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming after that because the Falcons don't have any more primetime games. So uh, <laughs> it's literally this. This is it. Uh, so, you know, I guess get hyped. Uh, you make sure you have your, uh, you know, drink, food, whatever you do of choice uh, ready because you'll probably need it uh, at some point in the course of the evening. So until then, guys, have a great night from all of us here at the Falcon Hawk uh, and Mr. ESPN, Eric Robinson. Have a great night, folks. We'll see you tomorrow. Ha, 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 ha.